Four major numbers on the board. We have a client, fairly new client, husband and wife. I'm currently working with wife. Wife is a mother of two, two kids. We're in the state of New Jersey. Income, just looking at wife, for the time being, we're not including all of husband's income. She only included what husband pretty much gives to her, I believe, right? So we're not including all of husband's income just yet, only because he is not fully on board. He fully supports what wife does. We're not fully on board yet in terms of all of his income, in terms of us combining all of our resources to accelerate and eliminate debt, do the infinite banking concept, do velocity banking, okay? So we're not fully there yet. Her goal is to produce results with really her numbers, then present it to husband, be like, look, I paid off this, I paid off that, I paid off this, paid off that. Come join me on this mission. I think together we could do a lot of damage on our debt. So income for right now is 13,600. That number could be much higher, right? So I wanna inform you of that early on. 13,600 we're currently working with. Expenses are 12,888 overestimated on expenses. Total debt altogether, $1,107,295. I did not display all of the debts because I just don't have enough space on my board. Plus some of the debts, a good portion of the debts are mortgages. So we're not too focused on knocking those out yet. We have some other major things that we want to do first before we even consider knocking down those mortgages. The other thing is we may not even pay off those mortgages at all because this is a particular situation where they were, were able to lock in really low rates on their mortgages. And this is a type of client that wants to do a bit of both. They want to pay off certain debts. They want to leverage debt that creates cash flow for them, right? So it offsets their cost of borrowing. And then they want to invest using debt and cash flow to create more cash flow, more cash flow passively, right? So that is our intent here, just so you know that, more context. This leaves us with a cash flow of $712. Now, what they've decided to do to boost up their cash flow temporarily for one year, just one year, is they're pulling a thousand dollars from their savings to their cash flow to help accelerate velocity banking. So that's why I put plus one thousand. So I, so technically they've got fourteen thousand six hundred that'll be going into the debt tool, right, into their line of credit, but they're not making 14.6. So that's why I just put that right here. 712 is the net cash flow after all expenses are paid. And then they're, you know, at the end of the month, they're pulling a grand and throwing it in the line. And that's going to increase velocity there. Cash on hand. This is savings. They have over $100,000 in savings. They have another account with a couple thousand bucks. I did not even include that, just including what wife has over 100 grand in savings. We have multiple debt tools, guys. Oftentimes, I will have clients that have multiple lines of credits. In this particular case, we have three home equity line of credits in the second position, all three of them. And they also have a unsecured personal revolving line of credit. I didn't even include the PLOC because of the higher interest rate and there's no balance owed on it. It's on it's zero. So that is just off to the side. When we're doing velocity banking, especially those in the house, go ahead and comment if you've been doing velocity banking for a year, two years, three years since we since I began four years ago with starting the YouTube channel. Go ahead and let me know if you, you know, started off with a credit card and then you upgraded to a P lock. And then from a P-lock, you went to a second lien HELOC. And then from a second lien HELOC, you went to a first lien HELOC, right? And so maybe you still have your P-lock and you still have two or three different credit cards and you just kept them, you know, off to the side. We don't close them, not ideal. They're just off to the side. That's additional capital in the event we ever need it. So that's how we, you know, operate when it comes to that. So let's go through their three debt tools and we're going to decide. I'm going to show you how I decided which debt tool to use. And I want you to comment what you think is the debt tool that we should use after I go through the numbers here. So the first debt tool is a home equity line of credit. Second position, we have a credit limit of 55391 and we currently owe 
55,246, so nearly maxed out. And this is at a fixed interest rate of 7.75%. And the name of this bank is Figure, F-I-G-U-E-R, Figure Bank. They offer home equity line of credit. And the second one is a home equity line of credit, second position, $52,910 credit limit, variable rate, 6.75%, credit limit, 52746 with a payment of $477, okay? Sec uh, third one, home equity line of credit, second position, 97468 variable rate, 7.75%, with a balance owed of 93938 Okay, so also near maxed out, near maxed out, near maxed out, right? This payment, $604, is an interest only payment. Okay, so I'm gonna put IO, interest only payment for this. The 477 is principal and interest, okay? And on here as well, the first home equity line of credit is also principal and interest. And let me just look at my notes real quick because I didn't put what the monthly payment is on that. Bear with me. The payment is 396 on that one, okay? So $396 also principal and interest. So for both of these, principal and interest. Those are the details. I'm gonna give you the answer that I and my client, we both came to an agreement on. We decided to use this one as our main debt tool. Sometimes, some of you guys that try to do velocity banking on your own, and then you hit me up after the fact, is you are doing velocity banking with your home equity line of credit and a P-lock, and you're doing something with a credit card or two, rather than directing all of your income, all of your cash flow, all of your expenses through one line, right? This increases efficiency tremendously when you bring all the money together into one central location and then deploy it. If you're having two, three different locations that you can send your money to, so this is your, let's go right here, checking account, boom, right? And then you've got a HELOC, a P-lock, and a credit card. If you're doing this, boom, with your income, right? You're doing this, so it goes into all three different accounts, that is a mistake. You increase, you decrease efficiency, you decrease effectiveness towards the principles of those balances. So let's say you owe like this case study, they owe money on three different debt tools. They were doing this before meeting me. They were doing this. Money comes in, income comes in, expenses go out, cash flow, boom. So they're making the monthly payments. The payments are included in the expenses and then cash flow, boom. Rather, we decide, okay, this one is my main debt tool I'm gonna use. Income comes in, boom, everything, all of it, into this line first. Then portion comes back out, only what we need to pay bills, and then pay the other two, pay the other two, pay the other two. All income in, expenses out, back to the checking, checking pays the bills, boom. That increases, just, just doing that alone, is gonna put you ahead of debt snowball majority of the time. Just that alone, because you're increasing the, the power of your cash flow rather than separating it, right? You're like, okay, I, on this day, I'm gonna pay this bill, and on that day, I'm gonna pay this bill, and on this day, I'm gonna pay that bill. Rather send all of the income and park it in the line right before the bill is due, boom, you pull it out, bam. So this means that the whole month, you had all your income knocking down this one debt creating so much velocity velocity crazy right so that's what we had to fix here so these payments 396 477 604 it's all coming out of this expense number right here and we still have that cash flow of 712 so what they were doing is they would take that 712 and they would send money here send money there send money here no bueno we don't do that we pick our main debt tool so now the question is denzel how do i pick right so just so you know we picked this one here are my reasons why a couple things that were floating through my mind number one that we can do a, a process of elimination this HELOC right here actually got locked on us and i tell you guys this all the time why we cannot over leverage ourselves when we're doing velocity banking 
or even when you're not doing velocity banking and you have a open revolving line of credit, we don't want to max out our debt tools, nor do we want to leave them maxed out. But here's the thing. Here's the big thing. Life happens. Okay. Life happens. If you're in the house and life happened to you, it is a part of life, by the way, it's going to happen. Our strategy to combat that makes all the difference. Our strategy to combat that makes all the difference as well as this component right here that can improve the whole situation, the faith component. Can't leave that out, right? So we need both. So I just wanted to lay that out because I get it, right? I'm not diminishing you in any way. If you come to me with jacked up numbers, that's my whole ball game. That is how I operate best bring me your jacked up situation bring me your mess god has given me the capacity to withstand the life happens the pressures of your situations and i'm still able to operate at peak performance right and past peak performance okay so bring it to me don't wait till you're six feet under and then want me to do magic because you heard about an awesome concept called velocity banking and now you want me to do magic there's no magic it's faith and works combine it recipe for dominion my friend it's simple as that but let's continue so i don't go off in a tangent three men that three main debt tools how did i decide well we did process of elimination this heloc is no longer a debt tool because it turned into a locked line of credit so when i pay into it 477 477 or if i pay all my income in i cannot withdraw the funds why maybe they maxed it out they hit max and then the bank closed locked it on them or just because they're near max and they locked it on them or maybe their property decreased in value i don't know the full situation we're actually confirming that right now but the client was informing me that they were like you know when i pay into it i don't see the available credit and that's the indication that they may have locked it on you when you can no longer see the available credit available for you to draw that could mean that they locked it on us right so process of elimination now we're just left with these two right this is a higher credit limit you might say hmm why don't we go after the higher credit limit one and there's space that's what i was thinking too initially i was here i was here because of this number being higher 604 over the 396 and because the rate was the same so on a higher balance i could technically do more damage actually that's a, yeah i could do more dam damage because the payment is there's more money coming here than here 604 over 396 that's where i initially was and then she told me i'm at a fixed rate over here i think i think that was the turning point for me that was a big factor it was a fixed rate only because of the environment that we're in today all because i'm also paying attention to that interest rates are gonna go up again like it's going to happen it's already happened like four times already this year probably gonna happen again in q1 maybe once or two more times before they stop so interest rates are continuously increasing what i was thinking in my head was okay i'll stick to the fixed rate if interest rates go up then this amount will increase it's going to increase her payment but by the time that occurs we would have done so much damage over here that i can then bring this higher credit limit uh this higher interest rate to the lower rate that's another big factor for me when choosing between your debt tools is i typically will choose the lower rate line so when we were discussing before she told me that this heloc was frozen right i said we should use this one because this is at a 6.75 variable lower than both of them and even if the rate did go up it might it's only going to go up by however much the uh fed increased the rate by so it might say it goes up 0.5 well now i'm at 7.25 still less than 7.75 fixed so i have plenty of time here not a whole lot of time but a good amount of time to create a lot of damage plus the 477 is a sweet spot so i was like okay there's more cash flow here the balance owed is very similar and a lower rate so initially guys i was here then i went to here right then she told me this was locked so i was like okay no then i was here then she told me this was fixed and i was like okay i'm gonna settle here so again if you've got multiple debt tools you're trying to decide i would say look at the lowest rate out of your main debt tools out of all the debt tools if there's a fixed rate option in any one of them i may consider that and this is another factor here whichever debt tool is further away from max out is also going to be attractive to me because i can knock that down 
a little bit more effectively and then chunk faster to that other debt tool, right? When the time comes. So <clears throat> three main debt tools, four major numbers, cash on hand, over a hundred. These are the other debts that we're focusing on. We got three loans, okay? 34 grand, 61 grand, 98 grand, all amortized, 7.99, 10.99, 7.94. All of them higher than 7.75 simple interest. So we don't even need to verify the math to say that, hey, 7.99, 10.99, 7.94 is higher than 7.75. If all I did was consolidate, move debt from here to here, I'm gonna go faster than debt snowball, period. And then these are the payments, 1137, 1250, 1210, lot of cash flow drainage here, major leak in our bucket, right, of the finances. And then here are the goals. They want to achieve financial independence in the next five years. We're 48 years old and 51 years old, right? So in the next five years, we want to achieve financial independence. Now, the definition from the FIRE community of financial independence, what that actually means, because a lot of people have no idea what this means. They think making more money than where they're at today or having a, a, a lump sum of money is financial independence. No, no, no. Financial independence is when you have enough money coming in passive that is equal to or more than your cost of living, your lifestyle. So in five years, the goal is to have $12,888 coming in passively, not active, passively. Maybe, you know, slight activity here and there, but you know what I mean? Like, I, I know I'm no longer like trading hours for dollars, right? Where that's majority of where I make my money. So that's financial independence. We want to do that in five years. We also want to become near debt free. Okay. And, and what I mean by that is the certain debts that we want to eliminate, which is the three debts over here and all of the credit lines they want to get rid of. That is, if you add all this up, that's a really big portion of the 1.1 million. And they also want to do infinite banking within the five years. We want to get some policies in place. The goal is four because they're a family of four, husband, wife, two kids. So four policies would be the initial goal. And then obviously we can keep going up from there. Cool. Just gave you all the context. Here's the strategy. First, doing velocity banking. We've decided our debt tool. Boom. Second lien. This is with figure. Okay. We owe 55246 What is our first move? Clients, ladies, gentlemen, moms, dads. What do we do? All income into the line of credit. This is my new checking account. Client has to move all their banking to that bank, right? Bill pay to that bank. Increase the efficiency. So do the math. 55246 times 7.75% fixed. We're looking at 4,281.56 in total interest in a year if I did nothing but just pay the interest, no principal. That's the total amount of interest that I can pay. Clearly, that's not what we're doing, right? We're not paying anywhere near that amount. But I still give you that context and then you divide that by 365. Our daily cost of borrowing is $11.73 a day for however long I owe 55246 right? We're not even going to owe that for a day, but I simply do that to create room for error. We're in December of 2022. This will all likely come into practice this month with the client because I just spoke to them. What was it? Two, three days ago. So this will likely come into play. All of this moving the banking, all that will get done this month. And then probably by January will be full force, right? Of 2023. So I'm going to assume, right? I'm going to lose a month on purpose to create room for error. And we're going to assume we're in January of 2023, starting at a balance of 55 to 46. That's just going to create room for error helps with the projection of where we should be, right? So income goes in 13,600. The balance goes down to 41,646 being the lowest amount. That's not actually what will happen, right? Unless the person, if you're someone that gets paid monthly, then yes, that does happen. But if you're bi-weekly, weekly, right? The money is coming in different times. So it's a total of 13.6 went in, right? But the balance never actually hit 41.646. I'm just getting an average, right? So I take that times it by the fixed rate. Boom, we're at 32, 227, 56, 
divide by 365, $8.84 a day. Look how we dropped, right? Then expenses come out. Nothing got paid off yet, right? 12,888, but this is an error, okay? Why is this an error, Denzel? Well, we're no longer paying 396 out of the income. How can that be, Denzel? Well, when you dumped your income in to the HELOC, that removed the payment. So there's no longer a principal payment. It's just interest. And interest gets pulled either on a daily basis when money goes in and money comes out. Interest gets calculated or it's applied on the due date. And that interest is coming out of the credit limit available, not your expenses. So we don't we don't qualify that as an expense because that's money coming out of the tool. It's not. It's staying in the tool. So that that all that money, all that 136 when when my income goes into the line, that's its principal first. Now, because this is a second lien HELOC where it's principal and interest payments, anytime we pay into the HELOC the only interest we pay is for that day, that money that went in or the previous days, right? So the payment gets eliminated. That 396 becomes cash flow. So technically, instead of 1288, right, coming out of the HELOC, 1288 is no longer coming out of the HELOC. It's 1288 minus 396. So we're really at 12,000. 492 but again created room for error but i just wanted to show you that when you're doing your numbers the payment gets removed of that 396 whatever the interest comes out to is less than whatever you were at before so you're at a net cash flow gain just by switching to velocity banking you create a net higher cash flow without doing anything didn't even pay anything off yet we're simply improving that 396 number to be more effective to the overall balance owed. Are you with me? Comment below. That's clear, Denzel. Or comment, you lost me, right? And I'll address it later. So expenses come out <clears throat> and the 1,000 in savings that's coming from here is being deposited into the HELOC one time a month, $1,000 payment. The most effective thing to do if you're gonna incorporate this kind of a strategy where you where you use savings to help increase velocity in your strategy, you're gonna wanna apply that 1,000 on the same day that you receive income. Combine it together, it becomes even more powerful, right? So that's a little tip there. So we'll end up at around 53,534 owed times 7.75, 4,148, 1136. This is your average daily cost of borrowing, right? You then, to get the median number, of the three, add the three, divide by three, you get $10.64, then times it by 30 days, we're looking at about $319.36, right? In interest, this is less than what they were paying here. Do you see that? 396 became 319.36. From that 396, when they just make the payment of 396 on the due date, they're paying more than 319 in interest, right? Want me to prove it? Here we go. 4,281, 56, divide by 12. 356, 73, right? Do that again. 4,281.56, right? That's that top line number from the beginning. Divide by 12. $356.79 from 31936. That is a $37.43 difference just in the first month, guys. The second month, it's going to expand. That number is going to be higher and higher and higher and higher. Just doing that alone, guys, I know $37 doesn't sound like a lot of money, but in the velocity banking world, it's a lot. It totally adds up very quickly, guys. This is what we have to pay attention to when you're doing velocity banking is these little, these little numbers here. Because when you start adding up everything else that you're doing, this is what propels you way past that snowball that avalanche this is the math nobody does online because they they keep comparing just the cash flow oh 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 you know 712 and 396 if you just made extra payments each and every month 
then it's gonna go faster than you know and i'm like no buddy no look this is the difference right here i'm 37 dollars 43 ahead of you and i didn't even pay anything off yet i just simply rerouted reroute reroute watch this then we add gravy on top credit card bills out of the 12,888 if we have about just a thousand bucks that we can run through a credit card and get two percent maybe three in cashback rewards guys for every thousand dollars that we run through credit cards we could get maybe 20 30 dollars plus in cashback rewards each and every month this is another thing that you you don't do in the debt snowball dave ramsey world so now i'm 20 30 40 50 100 dollars ahead of you each and every month where do you think that money is going that money is actually not going anywhere it's staying in the heloc because the cash back you apply it to the credit card statement which means less money comes out of your what your debt tool which means less interest over here now that 37 then becomes 42 dollars there's another five bucks another seven another nine each and every month increasing 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 okay so that is the math behind the math that most people never do and we're now going to look at some other opportunities that we can implement into our velocity banking strategy to really create some acceleration which is a 401k loan this is very effective in the right situation right numbers okay we have to map everything out this is a client that has what is it uh let me look at my notes bear with me this client has yep over 300 plus thousand in a 401k okay now we could borrow from an asset such as a 401k loan an ira right retirement account pension fund tsp right all those different terms we could borrow from that asset gives us capital to maybe wipe out some of your high interest debt and then instead of sending that interest to the institution you're now paying yourself back the interest now here's what i want to do guys because i'm not the expert on 401ks by any means okay never had one never will all right here's what i would like to uh, uh, get some clarification on we're going to do some market research together to really verify if what I'm saying is factual and true, right? So I'm gonna share my screen in a minute, but I wanna share some details here regarding 401k loans. I'm just gonna make a statement here. You you say, yes, that's correct, Denzel. No, that's that's not correct, right? Let me know if, that's, uh, uh, if I'm saying the right stuff here. So when I take out a 401k loan, I'm charged an interest rate. This is true. Yes, okay, you agree with that that interest rate that I'm being charged goes back into my 401k account. So I'm paying myself interest. I don't lose that interest. Is this true? Yes or no? Put a yes in the comment. That's true, Denzel. When you borrow from your 401k, right? The interest goes back into your account along with the principal dollars that you initially borrowed. Is that true? Yes or no? I read somewhere that that's the case when you pay yourself back the interest you're using after taxed dollars right you're using after taxed dollars to pay that 401k loan right and at the end of the 401k loan when i'm 59 and a half and i start to withdraw that interest that you pay to your 401k loan you're now going to get taxed a second time because you got taxed on the income you're making today taxed you have a net income that goes into your paycheck goes into your checking account and then you paid interest right it might come right out of your paycheck goes into 401k now that money is no longer growing tax oh it is growing it's growing tax deferred but you got taxed you didn't get a deduction on the interest on your income today is that true you don't get a deduction on the interest that you pay on a 401k loan because when you take money out against your 401k loan that's that's not a taxable event and you you can't get a deduction for debt right okay there's another yes there all right so yes and yes 
someone said no right but we're gonna we're gonna do market research and see are, are we am i crazy here or what so now when you go to withdraw funds you get taxed again on all that interest that you paid in the 401k loan now how do you measure that does it make sense to do that does it make sense to borrow from a 401k loan to wipe out interest higher interest over here institutional debt is there an offsetting effect that would occur or do i end up a negative years down the road so i get a positive now because i re i recover the cash flow today right and you might say, listen, Denzel, I'm at a point where I don't even like my 401k anymore. It's losing money, right? I'm paying exorbitant fees. So maybe you might have come to the conclusion where you stopped funding it. You're not even putting any more money into it. So you redirect that cash flow. And you're going to put it into a different vehicle that maybe can create tax-free income, right? Passive income through a business, real estate, and other things. You might be having that dilemma, right? If that's the case, then it's not even... Uh, a matter of a, a decision is that you're easily gonna yeah borrow from here let me fix today's situation now right fix today's situation and then i'm creating my new retirement plan i'm creating my new wealth creation plan away from 401ks right if you're in that camp then we're not even having an argument but if you're like no i love my 401k i love it right yet you have no idea what your cost of borrowing is you have no idea what your fees are your management account management fees your annual fees you have no idea what you're actually earning because you say you're getting an average rate of return of six to eight percent or whatever but what is your internal rate of return you don't even know so i'm not gonna go too deep into that I'm just saying this is you know you getting a clear understanding of how you're operating today and then what can we do so here's the research that I did. This uh, is called uh, Beagle, meetbeagle.com. Looks like a blogging platform or something, and they have a lot of content on 401k loans and different things. Okay, so here we go. Uh, where did I find it? Allows you to purchase the borrow against their retirement savings, pay back the loan over time. The interest you pay on a 401k loan goes back to your retirement savings and it will help you grow your savings further. You can borrow up to 50 grand if you have 100. So roughly 50% is what we could take out. A 401k loan allows participants greater flexibility in loan repayment compared to when using a bank loan. If your 401k loan has a term of five years, you can choose to repay the entire loan early without paying prepayment penalties. You can continue making the regular 401k contributions while repaying the loan using automatic payroll deductions. Okay. You're not subject to credit checks, so that helps. All right. So according to this website, yes, when you pay interest, it goes back into the retirement account where does loan interest go right uh, it goes back into your account however it may end up costing you more down the line why is that well i read here that there are some origination fees to even get the loan so you have to factor that into our cost and let's see tapping into let me make sure y'all can see that tapping into 401k loan loan can be a great way of actually uh, da, da, da. when face a significant emergency fund uh, da, da. however uh okay okay where did i see it this is good information right it's pointing you to the stuff fortunately both brands go back go directly okay this helps you bring your back up to where it was before you took the loan account the interest also makes up for the lost compounding interest your 401k would have received in the meantime so does that mean that when I take out a 401k loan, if I got 340 grand in there, am I selling stocks? Am I selling my index fund, my mutual funds? Are they being sold to then give me that loan, right? Or are the, you know, the administrator, the, the facilitator, the one that's holding my 401k account, are they, are they keeping the returns of, you know, say I got 340 in there and I take out a hundred, am I only going to earn a rate of return on 240? That's something that you would need to talk to that 401k provider about, try to get more transparency there, try to get more details, right? Uh, da -da. While the interest you okay, gosh, okay, typically is between one and 2% higher than the prime interest rate. I think prime right now is 6.25 or 6.75. So my rate would be 7.75. I don't know. It depends on what industry you work for, because I've had clients with TSP accounts in different types of government 401ks where the rates are much lower. And then people who work in the um, hospital industry or nurses, there's there's usually different parameters 
where I've seen loan rates as low as three, four. I've even seen a loan rate, 401k loan rate at 1.75%, but that was two, three years ago. I don't know if that's changed since then. So we're gonna get those details. We're gonna find out, okay, if it makes sense, the goal would be to get a rate that's obviously less than whatever I'm paying off, right? And then we've got origination administration fees. Okay. The negative, okay, here we go. It's not entirely a no-lose deal. You see, when you make payments towards your 401k loan, you do so with after-tax money. This is, in essence, eliminates the tax deferred benefits of your 401k because you're paying your 401k loan after tax money. You're paying taxes before you put money back to your 401k account. However, when you take that money out during retirement, you'll be taxed on that money again. This creates a double taxation effect on the money you put into your 401k. So while tapping into your 401k, loan may get you out of the jam because that's what we're solving for it can have costly effects down the road, okay? The other option, if a 401k loan doesn't make sense, then what about a securities-backed line of credit rates? Or is it called a margin account? I think they're called margin accounts. Margin rates as low as 4.33%. So between, so 25K would be 5.33, 300 grand. The more money you got, it looks like the lower the rate is. Margin rates, lowest margin fees. So there might be some fees. So a margin account, I believe, I don't know if it applies to the 401k or if it's only to your brokerage account. So you guys can educate me there. But I was telling the client that we could look at, you know, once you call them, we ask them if they do, if they offer a line of credit instead of a 401k loan, it might be cheaper to do a line of credit considering the fees and the costs and things like that. So we did a little research there. Let's take it back to the board. Okay. And let me look at some of what you guys are saying. So Dallin says no, right? Alexi says no. Ben says yes, you pay yourself interest. Andre, yes. Rachel, yes. Ben says yes, it is true, I've done it twice. So that's more credibility there. Interest goes to the brokerage that has loaned you those funds, okay? But according to Ben, that's not the case. So is it a case by case? Could be a case by case situation. Adrian says no. Rachel, yes again. Risk is if you leave your employer, often loan becomes due within 30 to 90 days. Okay. Also, payments are deducted from pay. All right. Good to know. Not unless it's classified for business or maybe buying a home, right? You are paying a fee, then interest. Yes, you pay. Okay. All right. So we got some back and forth, right? So we have to, it sounds like it's case by case. Depending on the loan, the 401k provider, you would need to get those details in advance before you make a move. I believe it's I believe it is sold. It's not like infinite banking, right? Money is only in one place at a time. 401k loan is always better than paying the loan to third party. And then obviously there's the con if I lose my job. I will say that the clients on the board here, nurse, information tech, very solid careers. They've been in it for multiple years. Don't see them losing their jobs. Margin accounts can destroy your entire investment account. Very true. So there's a management thing to that as well no retirement account allows margin okay so not a margin account but can i get a line of credit against my 401k can i go to another bank and get what's called a securities back line of credit at maybe a four to six percent rate against an asset that i have and then pull from that line to pay off some debts over here maybe that's an option and then you know the 401k loan is something on the table too so here's what i thought about if I was in this position, I was like, you know, I got 340 sitting, you know, and I'm paying exorbitant fees on this thing probably. How can I put this thing to work? So I looked at these two debts over here. We got a 7.99, 10.99. If you add the two, 34,503 plus 61,056, that's 95,559. Let's say I took that out of here, 401k loan, and I recover 1,137. 1250 and I move 7.99 and 10.99 gets moved to maybe anywhere between four and six percent. That's what I'm thinking is where the rate might be at on a loan. Anything below seven is it's going to be more attractive. If I'm not mistaken, it's the other thing we have to verify. The 401k loan interest, is it simple or amortized? I believe it is simple interest compounding. Okay. I don't think it's amortized. I do believe that it's simple interest, which would make the loan cost cheaper than an amortized 7.99 or 10.99. So the cash flow recovery would be 2,387. And then assuming I just did 95 and divided it by 60 months, 
five-year term, maybe the payment's somewhere around 1,650, so you net 737, okay? So if you net 737, all right, cash flow, plus the 1,000 that she's pulling from savings, plus the 712 that I already have, plus the 396, 2,845. So I go from 712 cash flow per month and with a couple of moves i'm at 2845 these debts are now gone <clears throat> and my dollars here are now working in my favor more effectively in the line of credit and in the 401k loan would you guys agree with that comment below i agree that my 1137 and my 1250 is working in my favor Despite the pros and cons of taking out a 401k loan, I will still come out positive because of the amount of savings here. My credit score goes up, right? Cash flow increases today, right now. And the interest that I was paying over here, it now comes back to my account, bring me back to, so I'm, you know, gonna be paying that 1650 moving forward, but I still net positive cash flow going to the HELOC, which reduces that rate of the 7.75 to maybe three and a half, maybe lower. So there's a lot of moving parts going on. How do we measure all that, right? We gotta write it all out, okay? And this is what I was doing with the client, right? I'm giving you the summarized version, but I'm, I'm giving you the points to focus on. There's a savings here. There's a cash flow recovery here. Interest goes back into this asset here. There's a savings and interest here, savings and interest here, cash flow, like it's all coming together. So with that being said, if I'm at say 2,845 in cash flow moving forward, balance was somewhere around 53,534, right? Cost of interest in the first month was 319.36. Maybe you were able to reduce it by 30 bucks. So it's at 280, 275, right? Let's say they're able to bring that down to like 275 from all the bills that they have that's food gas miscellaneous phone bill car insurance right it's everything whatever they can run through a credit card to get cash back rewards that's our second tool main tool second lien heloc second tool credit card still all money goes in money comes out pays that credit card when that's due on the due date all the money sits parked in the line all right so i'm gonna go quick to try to give myself uh, an idea of when I can actually make my first chunk inside of the HELOC to the next debt, right? So if I'm at 53,534, here's what I do with my clients just to go fast with it, right? This is just being quick where I'm like minus income minus 1,000, right? Because that was the savings. I'm like, all right, so now we're in February 2023, right? Because I said I skipped December going right into January. This was January. February. <clears throat> Go from 1288 minus, uh, da, 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 what was it? Yeah, 1288 minus 396 minus 737. So new expense number. Now we're at 11,755. That's less dollars coming out of the tool, right? Think I did that right? Maybe I made a mistake. Don't think I did because again, this 1000 is not coming from income. It's just being dumped into the line. So it's not increasing income. It's not decreasing expenses. It's just an extra 1k, right? So how do we verify that? 2845 minus 1000 minus 712, 1133. Yeah, I believe I had that right. Okay, cool. <clears throat> so 38,934 plus expenses, 11,755. End of February, here's where we're at. I did include interest, so the number would be a little bit higher, but let's keep it going. Boom, this is what I do. Try and get a range. Try to be quick with it. That's end of February, March. Considering the numbers stay the same. And again, like I mentioned, she could have between now and then, maybe she does convince husband, hey, by the way, I just paid off these two loans. Want to see how I did it? That might turn them on. Be like, what? You did what? Somebody just got taller, right? <laughs> so income goes in, expenses out, 45, one, five, four, May. And then you know what I forgot to do? I forgot to minus the thousand. So minus 1,000 for March, 1,000 for April, 1,000 for May, 42, 154, all right? So we got January, February, March, April, May. I would advise this client, I'd say, yeah, let's do velocity banking for about six to nine months to see where we end up, right? Then from there, there's another piece of detail that is happening with this particular situation. They have an IRS debt, okay? 
in the past they took out 401k money and there was a i forgot what the situation was but instead of it being a loan they thought it was a loan they ended up it was just a withdrawal of a lump sum amount of money they didn't realize then they had to pay taxes on that money so they're paying right now 543 a month to the irs that is cash flow that we could potentially recover they were gonna they're working on getting me the total amount owed and they're finding out if interest is being calculated on this debt i'm pretty sure the answer is yes i'm pretty sure they're getting charged interest and we have to find out what the remaining balance is if it's like 20 grand 10 grand something like that old left because they've been paying this for a while since i i want to say around when COVID started is when they did that cares act thing and they did something right so whatever is owed that's probably where i'm i might chunk next it might be very attractive because 543 is quite a bit of money to recapture and when we look at the other debts that are going on you know 52 grand is really high 97,000 is really high 98,000 really high I, I can't really pay anything off yet so i'd have to do that into multiple chunks the goal right now is to recover as much cash flow today as possible as quickly as possible and so the most next attractive thing that we want to go after is probably that irs debt get that 543 and that's going to bring my cash flow up to over 3000 in a matter of like under a year we go from 712 to now over 3000 plus in cash flow by then i'm pretty sure husband jumps on board income goes up cash flow goes up it's really going to improve this the goal on the main debt tool right 55391 times two thirds is 36000 so i want to see them get the balance below 36k before i make the next chunk right now when we look at the next thing that we could chunk at going back to the whole not over leveraging ourselves the only time it makes sense to go above two-thirds leveraged is when cash flow times 12 exceeds your credit limit times two-thirds all right so if her cash flow is above thirty-six thousand, i might be motivated to maybe go a little bit higher to go above this but the goal right now is to just create space in the heloc right we want to create space so if I'm at, so 2845 plus 543, 3,388, let's say that's new cash flow. I'm at 40 grand, 656. By the time I get here, what will the balance be on the IRS? We don't know. We don't have that details yet. If it's anywhere between 15 and 20 grand, I'm okay with either doing this. The safest thing she could probably do is we know that cash flow times 12 when we pay that off goes to 40,656 so i'll write that that would be cash flow times 12 conservative then we say okay 40,656 minus say 20 i would want to maybe bring the line down to 20,656 right so i'll do a i'll do velocity banking six to nine months and we'll see where's the balance at right what do we bring it down to then from there if it's not near here, then we'll go a little bit more to about 12 months being the max. By the 12th month, we should be here. And even if we're not, I'm okay with going a little bit higher than that 40, which is above two thirds. See how I did that? Because of the cash flow opportunity and understanding that if at cash flow of 712, right, 1712 with income 13.6 and expenses at 12.492. If that, those numbers got me a net borrowing cost in the first month at 275, understand that when there's more cash flow, your net borrowing cost is gonna be even less than that, even if it's still a, you know, a high balance owed. There's virtually no interest being charged on here. And then when you look at what did we do with the money? Oh, well, we rerouted all that higher interest debt into 7.75, 7.75 became less than 3%. And then it got offset by whatever interest I was already paying. So it's like a double effect of savings that just compound on each other. And that's where you get that acceleration, right? So that would be the plan. And let me let me run it a little bit more to get an idea of where we'd be at. So 42,154 minus income plus expenses, 1175 minus 1,000. So it's May. So we got 39, 309, that's June. That's six months, right? Let's go all the way to nine. Boom, 37. Oh, and then you got a minus a grand. 36, boom, minus a grand. 33, getting close. July, 
August. So June, so six, seven, eight. Let's see where we're at by month nine. Boom, 30 grand, not including interest, not including husband getting on board, not including her making more money, saving, spending less, conservative, right? Somewhere around 30 grand. So if we're at month nine, she feels comfortable and the IRS debt is say 20 owed, say that's the case. I would assume it'd be, would be, it would be less than 20 because I don't think they borrowed more than a hundred grand. So what? It, how much taxes is on a hundred grand? It's like 30 something percent, right? They're in New Jersey. So they, they're probably in a high tax. I think it's a high tax state, if I'm not mistaken. Um, so they might have initially in 2020, by 2021 is when they found out that they owed it. And so I would bet that they've been paying 543 at least for a year, maybe longer. So if it's 20, then it would bring me back up to near maxed out again, right? 50 from 55K. I may not feel comfortable personally. I may not feel comfortable. I say, eh, let's go a little bit longer, right? Let's go the full 12. Let's just keep doing velocity banking on the debt tool, right? Let's go a little bit longer. So 30,000. 774 minus income plus expenses minus savings because remember she's doing that whole strategy of moving a thousand moving a thousand moving a thousand for one whole year so i want to see what that net result would look like so that's september october boom minus a thousand we're at 25 oh eight for november i think i gotta go one more month right to make it the full 12. look at that twenty two thousand two thirty nine by december 23rd right and let's say the balance then is now now it's like seventeen thousand. let's say owed plus 22 239 30 ah uh, look how the numbers align look how they align don't you like it when the numbers just kind of like whoa okay i see where he's going i see where he's going all right cool so that's my parameter is you take cash flow times 12 of of what you would pay off so we're gonna we would pay off 543 brings the cash flow over three grand times it we got 40,656 that's my new high which is above two-thirds 36 grand off of the credit limit of 55,391 so cash flow times 12 is above two-thirds okay that's my new high if I feel comfortable going above this, I would only do it maybe a couple more thousand to do it sooner, to do the chunk sooner. Because obviously the sooner you make the chunk, the faster you get to the cash flow, the faster you're knocking down the line of credit again itself. This is another case in point of not having to wait to get to zero to what? Make the next chunk. At 22,000, their cost of borrowing is probably under a hundred dollars, right? And then you factor in the cashback rewards, it's probably like 70 bucks. So there's just nothing, right? From there guys, this is a whole year of doing velocity banking. And I would be willing to bet that probably, I gave her the time that I said maybe one to two years of velocity banking, we pay off the the tool itself, right? We, we bring that down. So now we have something to work with. We paid off near a hundred plus thousand over here and that got moved into the 401k loan. We're making monthly payments over there. They might get to the point where they're like, you know what? I'm gonna stop contributing to that and put more attention on debt elimination. Maybe they might wanna do that. Maybe they don't, so they keep it. I leave that up to the client, it's preferences. We run the math on both scenarios to see which one is most effective for them, right? At the While all that's going on, just know that we're still making our monthly payments on all the other debts, right? So equity in the property is going up within one to two years. I'm definitely going to maybe apply for an increase on the HELOC. Just creating more space. This 1210, this is going to be down quite a bit one to two years from now, right? In that one to two year time frame, we, we will likely the next debt after paying off IRS, the next debt that we will most likely hit will be this, right? Because this is such a low payment for 52 and this is 604 and this is interest only. So that balance is going to stay the same, right? Versus this 1210 is principal and interest. That 98 is going to drop much faster than 97. And it'll probably line up at somewhere around this number. We'll get close to it and we'll be like 1210 or 477. We'll, we'll go with 1210. Once this is gone, we can then have the discussion of infinite banking. Or what could happen is if they feel comfortable, they might say, you know what? I want to take a portion of that savings, right? They're, they're already doing 1K for the next 12 months. So it'll bring the balance down from 101 minus 12. 
they might say, I want to take 10, 15, 20% of that savings. And I want to move it over into IBC, right? Into a policy. They might want to do that or they might wait, right? So if they didn't want to wait, then we have justification of doing velocity and then also putting a policy in place because they have capital over here that is not being used currently. Now, in this situation, I know that they have plans for this 100K, so they, they might want to keep that liquid, right? But two years from now, cash flow is up four or five grand. We're in a very healthy position to now consider throwing in IBC into the equation to improve their savings strategy and their investment strategy down the line. So I'm going to share my screen again and share with you guys the parameters that I personally have in place when I'm developing a policy design for a client. So I think I'm, I think you guys can see that. Yeah, let's go like that. I think you guys can see that clearly. Yes, you can. Okay, cool. Here are my parameters. This is what I like to see when I'm working with clients that are in debt, or maybe you're not in a whole lot of debt. You're looking at the infinite banking concept and you're like, I want to, you know, I want to do this. I want to practice this. I want to put it in place. This is just a preference. This does not mean you have to have this. This is just a preference that I know that you're in a healthy financial position. The last thing that I want as a licensed insurance agent is to write a policy for someone that can't pay it three years from now because they were thinking too small. They were a small thinker, right? I don't like to work with small thinkers. So when you become a client of mine, just know that it's, it's like automatically just by hanging out with me, going through these one and a half, two and a half hour case studies, just by being here, you are not a small thinker. So I'm not calling you a small thinker by any means. I'm just challenging that thought process that you have, that the, the preconceptions that are in your mind that hold you back. I want to unlock that into big think. Velocity banking forces you to think big. Infinite banking forces you to think big. When you get around like-minded kingdom people, it, it just puts you in an environment where you got to think big. You're thinking beyond yourself. You're thinking beyond your family, right? You're thinking community. You're thinking kingdom, right? So here are parameters that are like, okay, this is a, a standard of measurement to see, am I qualify for this just qualifying yourself does this make sense for me to move forward have i watched enough material read enough books on this strategy to feel really confident that i'm not going to get duped by any insurance agent i'm not going to get sold into a strategy i'm coming to the table with a strategy and then i'm telling the agent what i want it's like going into a dealership and you're saying, I want this car, this trim, this color, this inside interior color, this exterior, these wheels, that, 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 that. And then the car salesman has to go and find that in their inventory rather than he or she tell you what you should get. You don't want to go into the conversation with an infinite banking agent where they're telling you what to do, All right? And I'm putting myself on the spot. I don't want to tell you what to do with infinite banking. I want you to come up with a strategy that we can go over together so that I'm in alignment with what you got going on, right? So here are the parameters. Cash flow 1500 or more consecutively monthly conservative. So conservative 1500 a month and consecutively you're doing that month over month, preferably. The second thing is you have the capital ready to go, whether it's through a debt tool like a HELOC or PLOC credit card where you do the balance transfer or cash on hand or some kind of an asset that you can pull from capital is ready to go to max fund it the first year so that we can immediately borrow and, and go to work with it. And then your cash flow times 12, right? Your cash flow per year times two thirds will help us determine a healthy funding amount. So if I'm cash flowing a hundred grand a year, two thirds of that is 66 grand. That is doable because I cash flow a hundred grand a year. So I could do 66,000 or 60,000 or 50. But if you're like, give me a hundred thousand dollar policy. Okay. Well, we have to figure out, are you doing anything with the hundred or is it just a matter of being able to dump as much dollars as humanly possible into that account? Then, okay. As long as we're clear on what we want to do with our money, right? You're coming to the situation. This is your money, right? Your situation. This is our finances together that we're all strategizing. Don't come to the table completely blind, right? You don't want to do that. 
the next is know how long we want to fund the policy and for how much, right? So we determine how much by looking at our debt tool, looking at our assets, looking at four major numbers, cash flow times 12, times it by two thirds, gives us a range, right? And then we figure out, okay, I'm 50 years old. I would like to fund this for the next 20 years till I'm age 70 or age 80, 75. You might say, you know what? In my family, the average lifespan of my family is 95 years old. So I want to design a policy where I'm funding it all the way up to 95 or maybe 90, right? You can do it that way. What I like to do with some of my clients is I try to ask them um, questions to determine their commitment level. Commitment, that's about that right? Yeah, commitment levels. What is that, Denzel? What is my commitment levels? Well, I would ask you how long you've been married, right? You might say 15 years. I say, okay, so you've been successfully married for 15 years. Awesome, cool. Um, how old are your kids? Oh, I have a 20 year old, an 18 year old, and a 15 year old. Okay, so you've been raising kids on average for, you know, 15 to 18 years. Okay, cool. Nice. <clears throat> Good stuff. So maybe you're raising kids and doing that for 20 years. And then I say uh, saving. How long have you been saving, mom and dad? Oh, we've been doing that. We, we've consecutively saved for the last 14 years. Investing. Mom and dad, how long have you been investing? Uh, we're kind of new at that. We've only been investing for the last five years, right? So these are not like deep emotional questions. These are surface level questions that I'm able to gather from you guys. And then what I'll do is I'll add up those numbers and get the average commitment span, right? So I say, all right, uh, 20 years plus 14 years plus five plus 15 divided by four. This, this person has an average commitment level of 13.5 years, right? This is how I determine length and time of funding. Because it's easier said than done to tell a client to fund it forever. I mean, that's that's easy to say that. But that is like, show me a case study where someone has actually done that. I have not seen it from anyone in the infinite banking space. I have never seen someone show a case study of somebody funding a policy for over 40 years consecutively for over 30 years. I, I have not seen it. Right. But I'm 26 years old. I've only been in the industry for four years, five years, right? So I still got a lot to learn. But if it was, if this was a popular stance, then shouldn't I be seeing case studies of people funding policies for 40, 50 years in America? I mean, if the average American can't even save a thousand dollars a month, a year, they can't even hold on to a thousand bucks. The average American, what makes you think they're gonna commit? to funding a policy for 40, 50 years, just because of the whole idea of becoming your own banker. I get it, it's an amazing concept, but it does take time for concepts to sink in, right guys? It takes time for a concept to sink in. It might take a generation. So if you're 55 years old, you're 50 years old, and your average commitment level based on your history with money is say 13.5 years, and that would be my measuring stick that would be my standard i say okay let's show a policy funding for 14 years right just round it up 14 years and maybe we show design funding it for 20 25 years so let's say we know we can commit to the next 14 years but we want to set the goal to do maybe double that number you know so maybe 25 years a little you know 10 years above or or double whatever 14 times 2 is 28 right so 28 years let's say is the goal so you're 50 and then by 78 you would have funded a policy for 28 years straight and in those 28 years you're now sharing that strategy with the kids and because they're younger and it sinks in their brain early on they start doing it as part of the culture in your household guess what by the time you pass Maybe you only funded a policy for 30 years, 25 years, but I can assure you, your kids will likely do it for 40 on autopilot. And now you just created a culture that will perpetuate. And then we get to the point where the, your kids, kids are funding policies for literally their entire life. Now it becomes like, oh, that makes sense. That's why the Rockefellers, Rothschilds, you know, the Morgans and the Fargos and the Chases, right? That's how in the Fords, that's how they've been able to do things for hundreds and hundreds of years 
consecutively through multiple generations, right? So it's being able to set that expectation, realistic expectation, set the goals high, obviously. I, I just don't want to be in a situation where I'm the agent, I wrote you a fifty, hundred thousand dollar policy, and you only intend to fund it for three years, five years, which is not a bad idea, right? That's that's not I'm not saying that's bad. It's it's bad if you say I want to pay in a hundred grand for the next fifty years and you stop by year five. That's bad. Because now you paid an exorbitant amount in fees to do that when you could have just did a five year policy, a ten year policy, right? So let's take it to the board real quick. <coughs> excuse me, excuse me. Still recap, four major numbers. Here's what we gotta know. Gotta know your four major numbers. Where do you stand financially? Cash on hand, what do you got? Assets, what do you got? Assets, goals, what do you want? Who do you wanna be? Where do you wanna go? Give me a timeline, right? Lay out all the debts. I need the balances owed, the interest rates, the monthly payments, the credit limits, the name of the debts. Give me all of it. Give me all of the numeros, por favor, please, please. Give me all the numbers, please. Then from there, we determine our debt tool. From there, we determine our chunk amount. Cash flow times 12, credit limit times two thirds. What are we hitting? What's the strategy? From there, velocity banking begins, right? Every six to nine months, I wanna try and do a chunk, 12 months being the max, anything past 12, we're thinking too far out, right? So that means you don't want to make that chunk too big where you can't pay it off within six to nine months or 12 being the max. Four to six is a really good position to be in. From there, no velocity banking. Then we eventually implement infinite banking in this case. By year two, maybe sooner, I could see this family funding a policy in the 30 k plus range that's just one policy and then maybe from that one they fund one in one on the kids maybe 3k 3k each each one or four or 5k each kid maybe husband gets on board his income improves all the situation now we're doing 30k and 30k you know i, I can easily see that happening over a period of two years these are not small thinkers they're not just thinking pay off debt. No, these people want to build business. They want to build generational wealth. They want to accelerate debt. They want to build credit. They want to increase income and cash flow. They want to build their careers. They want to walk in their purpose. This requires big thinking, guys. Big thinking.